Good morning, and welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church. We are an open and affirming church and a member of the United Church of Christ. And happy first Sunday after Easter. Friends, whether you are live streaming the, for the first time this morning, or this is the way you normally connect with this community of faith, welcome. Welcome. We are so happy to be connected with you on this day of resurrection. A couple of reminders for you this morning. Prayer requests. If you have things that sit on your heart or your mind upon your spirit, go to the homepage of ahcc.org and you will find a virtual prayer request card. Let us know what's on your heart and mind so that we can lift your prayers in our own prayers this week. Weekly programming continues even as we are closed as a church these days in social distancing. We have programming that's happening each and every week, Tuesday at 10 a.m. and Thursday at 12 noon. So if you want to catch some of our virtual programming, please just hop on our live stream at any of those times and also know that all of our programming, all of our worship services are archived on our church's YouTube uh, channel. And so just go to YouTube, find our channel, Asylum Hill Congregational Church, and you will find any of the services that you have missed or programming that you've missed or things that you may want to share with others and loved ones in your community. Also make sure that you uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we are always uh, making sure that we are connected with you on those social media platforms as well. And I would ask that you keep the goodness rolling this week. We love, we love, love, love seeing pictures and hearing your stories. Keep them coming so that we can be inspired by one another in these difficult days. For those of you who happened to be tuned in last week, uh, last Sunday, you know that we do not consider our church to be empty in these days of the coronavirus. Rather, we understand each of us, each of us to be deployed out into the world. So share your stories of deployment. What are you doing as a disciple of the Risen One? How are you spending your time being the church in the world today? Write it down. Send us pictures. Share it so, as I said, you can be inspired by one another. And lastly, this morning, as has become our Sunday tradition, I have a couple of shout outs. I say again hello to people in Minnesota and Texas and California and Florida. Hello to newly engaged friends, Liz and Nate in the Pacific Northwest. Hello to friends and family in Massachusetts and New York. Hello to folks tuning in who are with us in the United Kingdom and in Spain and in Ecuador. And good morning to those of you who reside along the Connecticut shoreline and those of you who are just down the road. Know that today, no matter the distance, we are connected by love and by spirit. I also cannot let today pass without marking a very very special moment in the life of this congregation. Today, we welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church, Pastor Jordan Rebholtz. I had envisioned this, I can almost hear in my mind's eye, the applause happening and the cheers. I had imagined this day a little differently for sure, but I am so excited, so excited that Jordan is on board and we certainly will be looking for opportunities for you all to get to know this incredible woman of faith who has officially become your new minister for early life. It was a blessing and a beautiful thing just a few short moments ago for me to look out across the chancel and to see both Tracy and Jordan and to know that 
our clergy team is complete here and now. So congratulations and welcome. I'm so excited to be sharing this moment with both of you. I also want to just say a thing or two about today's service. We have de designed this service of worship in three parts around the theme morning into dancing. Our first movement will be focused on lament, the practice of lament. What is lament and is it appropriate or why is it appropriate in these particular times? Our second movement will be focused on liminality, that time between lament and joy, that in-between time that sometimes is so very, very difficult. And our third moment will be focused on joy and hope. How does joy speak to the heart of our hope for better days to come? So friends, get comfortable, settle in, and let us now join our hearts together as we worship our risen Savior. Good morning and welcome to our worship service at this time as we move into our call to worship in an effort to connect even more with our sanctuary here and your sanctuary at home. I invite you if you have a candle or something handy to light it as we have lit our candles here this morning so that we can call upon the Holy Spirit to enter this place, our physical spaces, as well as each and every one of our hearts. Join me in our call to worship. Welcome to the worship of the Lord. Hear the words of Jesus as he calls us today. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This morning, God encourages us to come in all candor and honesty. Leave no burdens, cares, or pain behind. Bring it into God's presence and be welcomed. Join me in the unison prayer of invocation. O oh God, where our hearts are fearful and constricted, grant us courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. 
where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance, where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination, where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. All these things we ask in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Friends, as we move into our time of looking at lament, I read to you from the prophet Isaiah, from the 40th chapter, verses 6 through 11. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lament can best be described as a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. In the biblical sense, lament is often an expression of intense loss and is communicated poetically. Think about the Book of Lamentations, a collection of five poems written after the holy city Jerusalem had been destroyed. Poems that go to the very heart of suffering Expressions of intense sadness, anger, disbelief, questions about human culpability and the faithfulness of Yahweh, our God. Isaiah carries forth this tradition of lament when he writes from a place of exile. Again, the holy city of Jerusalem had been left in ruins. Its people carted off to exile in Babylon, and for decades they were forced to live as captives in a foreign land. And so we get this powerful poetic language. All people are grass, like the flowers of the field. Grass withers, flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows upon them. Surely all people are grass. Grass withers, the flowers fade. It's a poem in which we see Isaiah on behalf of the Israelites trying to make meaning of all the suffering that had been and was being experienced by God's people. It's a poem that gives honest expression to the questions that rise up from within when human beings suffer. And then we look around our world today. And we see the images of how the novel COVID-19 virus is ravaging human beings around the globe. People are afraid, and they are anxious, and they are angry. People are experiencing deep disappointment and a deep sense of loss. People are sick and suffering. People are dying 
while others are left mourning and grieving. So many reasons to lift our lament in these days. And friends, we must give each other permission to do this grieving and to grieve in a way that is unique to each and every one of us. You see, no one has permission to say it's been long enough, get over it. No one has permission to say your suffering is trite or unimportant. No one has permission to say this is God's will or God's plan, so we all just need to accept the way it is. No one. You see, there will always be people who have it easier than others. There will always be people who have it tougher than others. It isn't about one's suffering over another or grades or levels. No, it's about your suffering. It's about my suffering as individuals. Beloveds, in these days, hearts are indeed breaking. Lives are indeed being lanced. Let us not judge one another, but rather let us hold space for the ancient practice, practice of lifting our sadness to the Lord. And how do we do this? I believe it's about being honest, about opening ourselves to God. It's about trusting enough to be vulnerable, to admit for ourselves our real lament. But just a few nights ago at dinner, our nine and 11-year-old daughters seemed to verbally go after one another in a way that was unusual for either of them. One would say something and the other would immediately jump in. They were one-upping each other. They were trying to find fault in what the other was saying. They were correcting each other. It seemed like a real battle of wills. Finally, I raised my voice and sharply said, knock it off. I and everyone else at the table had had it with their back and forth nastiness. Well, both girls went silent, but when I looked over at my youngest, I noticed that big tears had formed and were rolling down her face. She looked at me and said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm just so tired of being stuck in the house. I miss school, I miss my friends, I miss being able to play, and it's making me very sad and very crabby. Beloveds, in her own way, this nine-year-old girl was raising her own song of lament, a passionate expression of disappointment and grief and sorrow so what song, what song of lament do you need to sing today? What burden do you carry that needs to be lifted to God? What disappointment weighs so very heavy for you? What fear is etched upon your spirit? What sadness is lodged deep in your heart? Let us in these moments bring it all before the Lord. In these next moments of prayer, I would invite you to give voice to your lament. We are asking you to take a moment and to open up your texting and to text to 22333. And then in the body, in the body of your text, place the code 120427 and write one word that either describes your lament or gives honest opening to your lament.
Our second reading comes from Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemies will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I have been shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Can two apparently contrary things both be true at the same time? Can one feel worried and abandoned and hurt and lonely and also place their trust and hope in a grace-filled and loving God? The practice of lament proves, yes, grief and hope can coexist. Expressing our lament is a natural and necessary exercise. There are poems of lament dating back over 4,000 years, and many of the Psalms in our Bible are poems of lament. Theologian Walter Brueggemann described the Psalms as a cry of need in a context of crisis. Sounds familiar. Here in Psalm 13, we see a beautiful example of lament from which we can learn much about prayer and faithfulness. In the first few verses, the psalmist turns to God to voice the very real feelings of grief and abandonment. We hear the psalmist's urgency and desperation. How long, O oh God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I'm sure many of us can relate to these poignant words. And while it says enemy here in this text, I suggest that the writer is likely referring to his or her serious illness or impending death. Regardless, these poems are understood universally. We each have our own enemies and battles and disappointments and failures. As a Christian, sometimes I feel the burden to always be full of faith and optimism, but it is not healthy or productive to minimize the injustices that are done or bury the grief that we all experience. When we give voice to our grief and doubts and anger, we are more capable of understanding our sorrow. Giving voice to our laments enables us to wriggle out from underneath the enormous and suffocating burden that we may be under. God can take it. God's not offended by honesty and transparency. God knows better than anyone the ugliness of life and the depth of human suffering. God invites us to share our lament. Acknowledging God's presence, compassion, and involvement, the second thing our writer does is ask for help and explains what might happen if God doesn't provide that help. Psalm 13 says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the death. About 14 years ago, I suffered a heartbreaking miscarriage that required surgery. In the pre-op area, I asked for a chaplain to come and pray with me failing to mention that I was a board-certified hospital chaplain myself. I asked her to pray for my fertility. I wanted so desperately to have a baby. She prayed a beautiful prayer in which she said, God, if it is your will, give her the gift of children. Now, I will admit there were times earlier that I might have said that in a prayer, God, if it is your will, but at this moment, I learned an important lesson. Frankly, it made me angry. I really related to the psalmists. I wanted my fertility to be God's will. I realized how much it meant to me in that moment to ask God for what I wanted and needed. 
without any qualifications or loopholes or hedging. The beauty is through the Psalms, we see God's invitation to ask for what we need, honestly and unapologetically. And finally, to the reader's surprise, after expressing the suffering and grief and making a petition to God, the psalmist expressed trust in God and praises God. It says, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is not gratitude expressed because God did what had been asked. This is truly an affirmation of faith, an expression of the writer's belief in a loving and benevolent God. In the past, I read this as a transition from negativity to positivity, but I'm grateful to know now that that's not what the psalmist was trying to convey. The psalm teaches us that the beauty, that the beauty of not necessarily transitioning from complaint to petition, to trust in a chronological way, but to understand, as one scholar said, the simultaneity of complaint and praise as an expression of the perennial reality of the life of faith. But finishing on a note of praise and trust in writing this lament, we cognitively move from a place of negativity to a place of hope and renewed commitment. Two things can be true at the same time. We can grieve the injustices and illnesses and inequities and still live in a place of trust and hope that God will be present to us and intervene on our behalves. As Pastor John Piper said in his book, Desiring God, this prayer language moves us to renew our commitment to trust in God as we navigate the brokenness of life. In voicing our lament, asking for help, and expressing our gratitude for a loving and present God, we can more likely be propelled forward into places of service, empathy, passion, activism, compassion, and hope. May it be so. Amen. And as the Psalms remind us, God is standing by to hear our prayers, our prayers of lament, petition, hope, and praise. There's no prayer that is too small or too big. There's no reason to bargain with God or to qualify your prayers. We are invited to be open and honest. Let us join our hearts together in prayer using parts of a prayer of lament written by Becky Bonham. Let us pray. Gracious Redeemer, the one who calls us beloved, we bring hurting hearts to you this morning, our fearfulness and our worry, our anger. Our world is not as it should be. In a world where hate is a virtue and exclusion sometimes a way of life, it is hard to hold on to what unites. It is tough to find common ground. Our humanity is lost in the scuffle. Those of us who wish for peace forget how to make it or where to begin and fall into hopelessness, cynicism, and despair. We too begin to feel powerless in the face of widespread suffering and systemic evil. Even our planet seems ready to crack under the pressure of forces that are beyond us, O oh God. Come, dear God, we pray. We pray for healing and comfort for the mothers of Helen Silchenko and Holly Landers. We pray for Bev Sears' father. We pray for peace and comfort for all who grieve in loneliness and isolation, for all who struggle with depression and anxiety, and for all who are suffering emotionally, spiritually, and economically. Uphold your children who are involved in caring for others in health care, doctors and housekeepers, chaplains and nurses, social workers, home health aides, CNAs, security personnel, first responders, and more. Reward them all with your peace and safety for their commitment and faithfulness to their callings. We pray for patience as we look toward another week of being physically separated from one another and from those we love. In this moment of silence, we lift up our own personal prayers of petition to you, O God, who hears our prayers 
and knows our hearts better than we know ourselves. We know, O oh God, that you are the one who plants peace in our hearts. You are the one who walks with us and carries us when we can't move forward alone. You are our companion in the good days and the bad days. Hear our petitions and answer us. For we are grateful for your generosity and love, for each new day, for the breath of life, for new birth and fresh beginnings, and for peaceful endings for spring sunshine and gently falling snow, for Jordan's first Sunday here with us, for the anniversary of Reverend Erica's ordination, for encouraging calls and smiling faces on Zoom, for daffodils and the emergence of farmer's markets, we praise you, dearest creator. In the name of the risen Christ we pray, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first words of the Bible are about God's generosity. God gave us the gifts of a beautiful creation, our home, the good green earth, and the animals that live here in it. On this spring morning, we thank God and offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow and be a blessing to the world. Amen.
Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our third scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The great author F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote that there are no second acts in American lives. But friends, I believe Fitzgerald was wrong. There are plenty of them. We all have examples of people or situations rising after defeat and creating something new. One of our most recognizable collective examples comes from American history. Teddy Roosevelt was a big star in the New York legislature and having a wildly successful first act in his life and career. He then lost his wife and his mother on the same day when he was only 25 years old. He was devastated. He felt that everything was destroyed. His familiar way of life was gone. After sinking to the lowest low, in time he felt ready to work again and rejoin the world, finding strength to get back into a 
new rhythm. He started working as head of the U.S. Civil Service Commission, the New York City Police Commissioner. Next, he joined the Army, became New York Governor, then Vice President. And finally, he was elected President, and his image was later chiseled into the cliffs of Mount Rushmore. No second acts. Ridiculous. Teddy Roosevelt had second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and even seventh acts. All of his experiences, the good, the bad, and the downright awful, culminated into the person that he eventually became. Second acts are where the story shifts. Past characters and moments suddenly begin to make more sense. Things become more connected, more clear. Of course, not all at once, but the layers start peeling back. And of course, second acts are a very familiar and important concept in the biblical narrative. After the crucifixion, the disciples were traumatized. With everything still fresh in their minds, they were probably suffering from serious PTSD, confused about their new reality. Who do they trust now? What was life going to look like? Their first act as disciples was over, and their new situation did not look promising. Then, as we know, little by little, Jesus begins to appear to them, reminding them that death isn't the end of the story, that death ends a life, not a relationship. In our scripture from John this morning, Jesus comes to his friends in very ordinary places, meeting them in their familiar activity of fishing and eating. It was in the moment of shared community and love that the disciples realized that this stranger was Jesus. They had not expected to see him in such a simple way, but just like Jesus always does, he surprised them by peeling back layers and revealing more of the story. For the disciples, this was the beginning of their second act. Grief was suddenly replaced by joy. Despair was quickly transformed into hope. Jesus had promised them before that their pain would turn into joy, and his appearance proved that this was coming true. The new reality after tragedy was now beginning. Resurrection was continuing to happen. So friends, what does it mean for us to have hope in this world, in this time? A world that seems to be constantly changing and distancing and increasingly more complicated. C.S. Lewis once famously remarked that he believed in Christianity just like he believed in the sun. Not only because I see it, he said, but because by it I see everything else. Picking up on Lewis's comment, Brandon Ambrosini, who covers culture and religion for Vox.com, wrote this. That's how I see Jesus' resurrection. Not so much an event I look at, but an event I look through. For me, it remains the interpretive key to the entire universe. Each morning, the sun is reborn. Each spring, harvests come back to life. After each disappointment, our dashed hopes are reanimated and can soar to even higher heights. For all the death and evil and greed and ugliness of our world, I can't shake the fact that every last atom of this place is pulsing in time 
with the rhythm of resurrection. Put your hands on your chest. Feel your heart beat. That's the rhythm of resurrection. We are resurrection people. The resurrection of Jesus, while a physical event, is more importantly a spiritual reality, a hope-filled reality. Jesus offers us invitations to live into our own second acts. And in this time in history, I believe we are all called into a global second act. One that includes different kinds of action and new imagination, different ways of connecting and creating. That's our task, figuring out what the world needs now. Perhaps the second act that we're moving into can be powered by the Holy Spirit and more focused on service to others, real ways of sharing our hope, reminding ourselves and the world that death never gets the last word. We are resurrection people. We are called to be the hopeful, the ones who believe that God can take this mess and make it something beautiful and new and pulsing in time with the rhythm of resurrection. Amen. Friends, at this time, we are going to see something really beautiful. The, the concept of hope can at times seem like this sort of ethereal or intangible thing. We can talk about it, but pointing to hope can be a little difficult. So in Paul's letter to the Romans, when explaining what he believed to be the way we as Christians can embody love in action, he wrote these words, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope. This week, we were invited to share images of things that bring us joy. These are tangible things in our lives that I believe make it possible to have hope. Let us take this time to share in each other's joys and be thankful in prayer.
God is a God of emotions and is able to handle all of ours. Let us ever be mindful of the things that God has continued to bless us with. Even when our days seem to be defined by isolation or lack of physical interaction, God shows us the ways in which the Spirit comes to each of us with moments of love and creation. Our God of hope and joy helps us remember that we are resurrection people. We are empowered to reshape the ways that we see the world so that we can ever be moving towards seeing it through God's eyes. We are desperate to believe that there is beauty on the other side of whatever it is we might be going through. But let us be the hopeful. Amen.